This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword using only Ghost-type Pokemon. The Ghost type is among one of the coolest types in the franchise. With two immunities, a range of secondary typings, and an arsenal of tricks at their disposal, these Pokémon are excellent additions to almost any team, assuming you get one, that is. Although any Pokémon can technically be a Ghost if you hit it hard enough with your car, Ghost-type Pokémon are few and far between in most games. However, Sword and Shield are exceptions to this, with over a dozen possible Ghost-type encounters, many of which are available pretty early in the game. And with Halloween just around the corner, now's the perfect time to celebrate all the Pokémon that go bump in the night. So, grab a loved one, settle in, and get ready for a Halloween story filled with frights, delights, and so much more. The Nuzlocke Spooktacular of the season begins right now. Sword and Shield are some of the few games that let you get a Ghost-type Pokémon before the first gym. Before that, though, I do have to button mash my way through getting my starter Pokémon and meeting a handful of overbearing British people. Or Peepo, as they call themselves. But after a solid 20 minutes of mostly cutscenes, my rival Hop and I arrive at the wild area, where there are plenty of encounters awaiting. But Pokémon aren't the only things that lurk in the shadows of the wild area. No, out there lie horrors beyond your wildest dreams that'll make you shudder and scream in fear. Nightmares like low poly trees. After mustering up enough strength to brave the terrors of the wild area, I start catching the first few available encounters. First is a Drifloon from South Lake Milos. Shortly after that is a female snow runt from West Lake Axwell. She'll be able to evolve into a Frostlass once I get a Dawnstone, but until then, she has to go in the box. Next, I head to Watchtower Ruins and catch a Duskull, which brings my list of usable teammates up to two. While searching for a Ghastly in North Lake Milos, I run into a Stuffle and decide to get some easy XP with Airhead since I figured that the normal fighting Stuffle wouldn't have a way to hit my ghost types. But boy was I wronger than when I just used wronger at the beginning of this sentence. Stuffle knows Brutal Swing, which crit kills Airhead the Drifloon. Basically everything in this game has dark type moves. It sucks. Although Drifloon isn't the best encounter, I decide to end attempt one here so that I can have as many encounters as possible. Since I didn't really do anything challenge-wise, I don't bother fully restarting the game, I just release my current Pokémon and catch a new batch. But it isn't long before I have to reset again after the Drifloon I'm trying to catch kills my Duskull with Hex. Well, on attempt 3, I do successfully catch Airheads the Drifloon and Dots the Duskull. Then, I decide to not press my luck any further and just move on with the game. After sitting through the opening ceremony in Motostoke, I can make my way to Route 4 where I catch a Pumpkaboo, the perfect little fella for our Halloween Spooktacular, and personally one of my favorite Ghost-type Pokémon. For the question of the day, let me know what your favorite ghost type is down in the comments. Anyways, I named Pumpkaboo Candy Corn, and with my spooky couple, now a ghostly thruple, we head to Turf Field to face off against the first gym leader, Milo. As with all the gym leaders in Galar, Milo Dynamaxes his team's ace. And while I could also Dynamax one of my Pokémon, Dynamaxing tends to make these games a walk in the park, so I won't be using Dynamax against enemy trainers. I will be using it in raid dens to farm for items, but in all other instances, it's banned. I'm also banning Shedinja, which was a possible encounter that I could have gotten by now. Shedinja's ability Wonder Guard trivializes anything that doesn't have a super effective move. For example, none of Milo's Pokémon have a way to damage Shedinja. So, no Bug Carcass for me. Instead, it's up to Airheads and Candy Corn. His lead Gossifleur goes down to two gusts as she just hits a soft Magical Leaf. As you can see by Gossifleur going down, every Pokémon in my party gains XP from every single knockout, and this feature can't be turned off. This makes XP management pretty difficult, but just as a reminder, the current level cap starts at the start of the gym battle. Anyways, Milo's second and last Pokémon is Eldegoss, who Dynamaxes on her first turn out. Dynamax Pokémon can be pretty difficult to play around, but early access to the Protect TM really helps out. Protect doesn't fully block a max move, but it does reduce the damage to a fourth of what it would be full power. With that, it's relatively easy to stall out Eldegoss's three turns of Dynamax, since the only way that she can hit my Ghost-types is with max overgrowth. 
which Airhead resists. We still have to dodge a crit or two since Airhead's is about as frail as you'd think an undead balloon would be. But with Dynamax over, I can now switch to Candy Corn on a soft Lafage. Candy Corn then hits Eldegoss with a Trick or Treat, which is a cute little signature move that adds a ghost typing to the targeted Pokemon. This means that Candy Corn's priority Shadow Sneaks now do super effective damage. So, a few turns later, Eldegoss goes down, and we've won our very first Gym Badge. I'm glad I got to pull off using Trick or Treat at least once in this video. It really puts me in the Halloween spirit. And you know what else puts me in the Halloween spirit? Talking about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. No, I will not be elaborating on that segue, that's all you get. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Setting up your own website can be tricky. Fortunately, with their all-in-one platform, using Squarespace is a treat. It's scary how simple it is to quickly design polished websites using Squarespace's customizable templates. For example, it took me no time at all to launch my own website, poppyhg.com, the home of dozens of curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. I finally got around to giving the site another update, so check it out for brand new Poppy pictures. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. With the first gym cleared and a few more levels on my Pokemon, I decide that it's safe to head back to the wild area and catch a Ghastly, who I name Whoppers. At this point, I also decide to make the trek to the Isle of Armor. Accessing the DLC is predominantly why I chose to play on Sword instead of Shield, since that's the game I purchased the DLC for. Even though you can also go to the Crown Tundra right away, all the Pokemon there remain at post-game levels, so any encounters that I can find are unusable, and farming items is incredibly risky. The Isle of Armor, however, does scale, which gives me access to a few more resources right away. For starters, I can head to Loop Lagoon and catch a Sandy Gas named Fun Dip, yet another one of my favorite ghost types. I just love the goofy little shovel protruding from her head. After exploring most of the island and finding at least 50 Diglets, I can also get an Alolan Marowak from this random dude in the Fields of Honor. Red Hots would be a super strong Pokemon to have this early in the game, but unfortunately he's over the level cap. So for now, Snowcaps the Snowrunt is getting a buddy in the Cold Dark Box. As they say, indefinite purgatory loves company. That's all that the Isle of Armor has to offer for now, so it's off to Holbury to face off against Nessa for the second gym badge. Along the way, I have to square off against Team Yell. Doing a ghost-type monolock in a game where the quote-unquote enemy team specializes in dark types was a bit stupid. It was also stupid to play in Sword, since Sableye, the only eligible encounter that takes neutral damage from dark types, is a shield exclusive which I didn't know prior to starting the challenge. Mimikyu also takes neutral damage from Dark-type attacks and would be incredibly useful with her part fairy typing, but to the best of my knowledge, I just couldn't figure out a way to get Mimikyu prior to the postgame, since foggy weather in the wild area only appears after you become champion. I didn't know that prior to starting the challenge either. I did basically no research is what I'm saying. Fortunately, against these random grunts, things work out fine, and I'm rewarded with a bite which in hindsight would have been useful to get before looking for diglets around the Isle of Armor for over an hour. Anywho, the second gym leader Nessa specializes in water types. Her Dreadnought is super scary because he knows Bite, which turns into Max Darkness when he Dynamaxes. But lucky for me, I have at least one friend, or work colleague depending on whether he's been mean to me on Twitter that day, and with Poppacy's help, I can evolve Candy Corn into Gorgeist via trading. With my new Gordy pal, I'm able to steamroll through Nessa's first two fishy friends. Goldine and Aracuda are both nuked by a single seed bomb apiece. Her dreadful Dreadnought is out last, and because he Dynamaxes, we aren't quite able to get the one shot with a single seed bomb. But since Candy Corn is relatively bulky, at least on the physical side, his follow up Max Darkness does just over 50%. So, with one last seed bomb, we quite literally blow up Nessa's turtle, like he just straight up explodes. It seems like a pretty horrifying way to go. But regardless, the second gym badge is ours.
Up next is a handful of mandatory battles as we head back to Motostoke to take on the third gym leader. One of the downsides of visiting the Isle of Armor is that Mustard's stupid son Hyde gave me an XP charm that boosts the XP I gain from all battles by 50%, which as far as I know, I can't get rid of. That makes XP management even harder, especially when the level cap doesn't change much between gym battles. Anyways, most of these mandatory battles are a walk in the park. But having not played these games in a while, I forgot that I have to fight my second rival, Marnie, before heading to the Motostoke Stadium for the gym challenge. Marnie, of course, specializes in dark types, and thanks to the various battles on the way back from Holbury, Candy Corn is so close to overleveling that I can't use her in this fight. The result is that Marnie's hangry gerbil outspeeds and kills my entire team with bite, bringing attempt 3 to a swift and unexpected end just when I was getting attached to my undead friends, too. But it's not their fault. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. This is just another example of how game knowledge is basically the best skill you can have as a Nuzlocker. Unlike the previous wipes, I have to do a full reset here, which means I need to sit through the entire first part of the game all over again. Meandering through the slumbering weld with Hop for the second time in as many days really makes you question your life choices. But after several hours of grumpy gameplay, I'm back to the fight against Marnie. And this time, in addition to managing my XP better, I've also reached out to a second friend, humble brag I know, who helped me fully evolve Whoppers into Gengar. Gengar is a phenomenal Pokemon in general, but Whoppers has a few tricks up her metaphorical sleeve that make her invaluable in this challenge, and specifically against all of Marnie's relatively annoying Pokemon. She starts with Krogunk, who's not actually a dark type, but still threatens with super effective sucker punches. This is easy to play around by using Hypnosis to put Krogunk to sleep, which then guarantees at least one turn of sleep on the following turn. This means that it's then safe to take out Krogunk with a Hex. I do manage to miss the first Hypnosis, but what do you expect from a 60% accurate move, right? Once the Toxic Frog is taken care of, Scraggy comes in second, and I just know that you're all going to freaking love this. I decide to try to take out Scraggy in one shot with Focus Blast. Worst case, I miss one, but Scraggy only knows Beat Up, which doesn't do that much damage. Except that it kinda does. Fortunately, the second hit from Beat Up triggers Whopper's Curse Body, preventing the little hoodlum from damaging us at all on following turns. This is pretty fortunate, because somehow Whoppers manages to miss the next three Focus Blasts. I mean, I know that it's basically a meme that Focus Blast has crappy accuracy, but at 70%, the probability of missing four times in a row is less than 1%. After Scraggy's beatup got disabled, it would have been smarter to just go for a few hexes, but after each miss, I gave in to the logical fallacy that surely I couldn't miss another one. At the very least, Whoppers manages to accidentally hit Scraggy with her fifth focus blast, just as beatup no longer becomes disabled. So down she goes. That brings in more Peko last, which means it's time to flex Whopper's most dastardly trick, a move called Reflect Type, which, as you might have guessed from the name, changes the user's type to reflect the opponent's type, meaning that in this instance, we resist more Peko's dark and electric type moves. Now, Whopper still has atrocious physical defense, so she doesn't take no damage from more Peko's attacks. And having used up all of our Focus Blast PP on Scraggy, it's not exactly as clean as I was hoping it would be. In fact, after missing a Hypnosis, but managing to disable Bite with yet another random Curse Body activation, I decide to just finish off Marnie's Vermin with Fun Dip, who is now immune to all of Morpeko's remaining attacks. This wasn't the cleanest battle, and certainly not the greatest performance from Whoppers, but I'm a bit at the whim of whatever TRs I manage to find, and there's a guaranteed free Focus Blast TR in the Isle of Armor. Once I get a Dazzling Gleam TR though, Whoppers will be an even better Dark-type counter. For now though, it's off to Motostoke Stadium to fight Kabu and his fire types for the fourth gym badge. He too has a Pokemon with a dark type move, an Arcanine that knows Bite. In addition to that, his other two Pokemon are pretty strong for this point in the game, so in general, he's one of the tougher Galarian gym leaders. Fortunately, I can get one last encounter that will make this fight much easier. And ironically, that encounter, a Litwick named Fireball, is actually caught during Kabu's gym challenge. It's the classic folly of an enemy all but giving the hero the tools necessary to defeat them. As our battle begins, I lead with Fun Dip to set up Stealth Rocks. He's holding a Raspberry to heal the burn induced by Kabu's lead Nine Tails. Then it's off to Fireball for his debut performance. Fireball has the ability Flash Fire, making him completely immune to Fire-type moves, meaning that he completely walls the Nine-Tailed Fox. 
It was a 50-50 shot to get Flash Fire instead of Flame Body, but I did make sure to craft an ability capsule from the Kramomatic on the Isle of Armor in case I needed to change his ability. Despite not being able to damage Fireball, the AI isn't smart enough to switch out, so after a few turns, we have Ninetales confused and sitting at around 1 HP. I take the opportunity to switch to Fun Dip, hoping that Ninetales will take herself out, but she does unfortunately connect through the confusion and hit a Will-O-Wisp. Bummer. She connects through confusion again on the next turn to hit an Ember, so by the time she goes down, Fun Dip is already at around 50%. That's not ideal, considering that Arcanine with Bite comes out next. But, assuming no crit, Fun Dip should be bulky enough to survive one bite and then nail Arcanine with an Ur or he gets flinched. Okay, well off to Candy Corn, and it's time to dodge some more crits. After somewhat tanking a bite on the switch, Candy Corn manages to dodge a Will-O-Wisp and connect with the Leech Seed. Thanks to the Willow Miss, it's safe to slowly drain Arcanine out of HP with a combination of Leech Seed and Protect. We do have to tank a fairly hard Flame Wheel as we hit a Trick or Treat, but by the time Arcanine falls to a Shadow Sneak, Leech Seed has recovered most of the lost HP anyways. This sets us up nicely for Kabu Sentiscorch, who instantly loses 50% of his health to Stealth Rock on the Switch. Candy Corn theoretically baits Sentiscorch's Fire-type Gigantamax move here, though the AI can be a little weird about what max move it chooses to use. Fortunately in this case, I'm correct, and the move does nothing to Fireball as he comes in. Sentiscorch's only other attacking move is Max Flutterby, which Fireball Quad resists, letting him tank the attack and get off a Confuse Ray. Sentiscorch also appears to be quite a bit dumber than Nene Tails, because he promptly hits himself in Confusion on his third turn of Dynamax which then allows Fireball to freely nail him with a Nightshade. As Sentiscorch shrinks down to his regular form, things are looking pretty much wrapped up. To add insult to injury, Kabu's Ace hits himself in confusion again, before one last Nightshade seals the deal, winning us the third Gym Badge. Fear the candle, Kabu. Fear him. With three Gym Badges in my little medallion thingy, the northern part of the wild area opens up, which grants me access to a bunch of new encounters. Before that though, I head back to the Isle of Armor, find 50-ish Diglets again, and get Red Hot's the Alolan Marowak, who's now able to join the team. Despite the stellar performance against Kabu, Red Hot's will be replacing Fireball as our resident Ghost Fire type, since the latter doesn't evolve until the tender level of 41. Gotta love Generation 5 Pokemon. As I head north through the wild area towards Hammerlock, I catch a Golet named Nerds, which gives me Ghost Ground Redundancy. I also pick up a Dawnstone, which lets me evolve Snowcaps into Frostlass and officially bring her into the rotation. Then, in Hammerlock Hills, I catch a Hone Edge, who I name Warheads. Pretty fitting to be using a literal sword in Pokemon Sword. This thing is phenomenal. To the left of Hammerlock, I run into a pair of Team Yell Grunts who fight me in back-to-back -back battles. The first Grunt has a Stunky and a Galarian Lanoon. The Stunky manages to do decent damage to Red Hots with a combination of Bite and Aftermath. And then the Lanoon ends up hitting Gorgice with a critical hit Night Slash on the switch. I manage to take her out with two C bombs before she does any more damage, but the result is that when the battle against the second Grunt starts, my two bulkiest Pokemon are both at around 50%. So my only play is to hope that Lyapard doesn't crit Red Hots with an Assurance. But she does. Alolan Marowak, especially with a Thick Club and Rockhead, is pretty phenomenal, and I was really looking forward to getting to use him. Maybe in another life, our time together would have been longer, but a critical hit from a random Lyopard was his destiny, however cruel that may seem. Rest in peace, Red Hots. Rest in peace. Also, I really need to get rid of Focus Blast on Whoppers. Like, you're really gonna miss again, Whoppers, while I'm monologuing? I mean, fortunately, Curse Body activated again, so even if I missed yet another Focus Blast on the next turn, things would have been fine. Okay, after reburying one of my strongest team members, I head further into Route 6 and catch a Galarian Yamask who I named Kit Kat. As a side note, by exploring the Isle of Armor every day, I'm able to pick up a few mints that can be used to change the natures of my Pokemon. I don't go out of my way to find specific mints, but if you see Kit Kat and a handful of other Pokemon's natures change, that's why. Anyways, my third Ghost Ground type is the best of the three, because we can evolve her into Runarigus almost immediately. If you've never used Runarigus before, this thing has probably the weirdest evolution method in the entire franchise. You start by having Yamas take at least 49 damage in battle, which can be done safely by spamming Endure against wild Pokemon. Then you have to walk under this completely random stone structure in the wild area, which instantly triggers the evolution. 
Whoever pitched this evolution method was definitely on one. But anyways, that adds another bulky mon to my ever-growing roster of ghosts, and this one is probably the most terrifying one yet. Like imagine coming across this thing in the dead of night. If you don't sh** your pants, you're living a life without fear. While exploring the wild area, I accidentally find a frillish in bridge field, just walking around in the grass. I had no idea I would be able to get one of these before getting the duck boat extension of the Rotom bike a few gym badges down the road. So that's pretty neat. Though, since Jellybeans is another Unova Pokemon, it will be a while until he evolves into a usable Pokemon. After pummeling my rival Hop into a childhood crisis, it's off to fight B for the fourth gym badge in the Stow on Side Stadium. Along the way, Warheads has evolved into Aegislash, which is frankly just about one of the best Pokemon in the game. Ghost Steel is a phenomenal typing. Now, obviously B's Pokemon can't hit any of my Ghost types with their Fighting type stab moves, so that's cool. But what's not cool is that every single one of them, except her lead him on top, has a dark type move. Seriously, I've never noticed how many Pokemon get freaking dark type moves until this playthrough. Fortunately, I've decked out Whoppers with a few TR moves after spending some time doing raid battles in the wild area. It did take a while to do this, so I turned off battle animations to speed up the process and forgot to put them back on for this fight. My bad. But with an Expert Belt, Psychic and Dazzling Gleam are enough to one-shot all of B's first three Pokémon that don't Dynamax. Last is Hermachamp, who knows Knock Off. So, after she Gigantamaxes into a form that wears leggings instead of just a pair of tidy whities Whoppers uses Reflect-type to resist a fairly strong Max Darkness. The type change now baits Machamp to use Max Strike to lower our speed, which grants me a safe switch to Warheads. Then, I let Machamp hit Warheads with a Max Darkness, which in his shield form will never kill, but does do enough damage to activate a Citrus Berry, thereby giving us more HP and preventing Machamp's knockoff from doing more damage post-Dynamax. The downside of using a Pokémon like Aegislash is that it's really tedious to switch between forms with King Shield all the time, which makes editing gameplay pretty annoying. So I'll do my best to cut around it with some quick transitions. In this case, it doesn't even seem to matter, because for whatever reason, Machamp refuses to go for knockoff now that she's back in her speedo. It's possible that similarly to speed control moves like Rock Tomb, the AI won't go for knockoff if you don't have an item attached. Not sure. But either way, that makes it pretty easy to finish off Machamp with a few Aerial Aces and win us the fourth Gym Badge. At this point, the Gym Badges start flying by until pretty much the end of the game. It's a short trek through Glimwood Tangle where I catch a Sinistee named Jujubees. Resisting the urge to dump them in the harbor, I use a Cracked Pot to immediately evolve Jujubees into Pultigeist. There are a handful of other possible encounters later in the game, but I decide they aren't worth going for. So this Kappa marks the final encounter of the run. The level cap didn't increase much after beating B, and with a lot of mandatory trainers now having fully evolved Pokémon, plus that pesky XP charm, a few of my Pokémon end up over-leveling before I can start the battle with Opal for badge number 5. One of those Pokémon was Warheads, which would have been excellent into Opal's Fairy-type Pokémon, but instead he has to sit this one out. Fortunately, Opal's gym is one of the easier gym challenges, since throughout the battle she asks you personal trivia questions that give your Pokémon stat boosts if you get the correct answer. Plus, her Alchemy, even in Gigantamax form, doesn't threaten with all that much damage, making this fight pretty trivial. No pun intended. With leftovers for recovery, Kit Kat pretty much single-handedly takes care of the entire gym. After all creamy Dynamaxes, she starts spamming Sweet Kiss, which requires some switching to avoid being taken out by a crit, but this battle is more tedious than it is interesting, so we can just skip most of it. That's the fifth gym badge obtained. From here, it's a stone's throw to get to Sir Chester, where the sixth gym leader Gordy awaits with his rock types. In between these two gym badges, I spent a good deal of time exploring the wild area and leveling up my other Pokémon, so once again I forgot to turn battle animation back on. Oopsie doopsie, as they say. Gordy is also not particularly hard, so to conserve XP, I leave some of my heavy hitters on the bench. Gordy's lead abomination gets Mercy killed by a single seed bomb from Candy Corn. This brings in his Shuckle second, and for the greater good of the run, we're gonna have to violate the cardinal rule of Pokémon. I start with a Leech Seed. Well, actually, I start by missing a Leech Seed, but then on the second turn I connect. So after that, I switch to Jelly Beans, who has evolved into Mr. Pringles. Shuckle just keeps going for Rock Tomb, desperately trying to outspeed my Pokémon, which are by no means breaking any track records, but are certainly a fair bit faster than Shuckle with his base speed of 5. 
Not the best AI design. Shuckle is defensive enough to survive a surf, but it isn't long before he goes down and Jelly Beans is sitting pretty at full HP. Third is Stone Journer. He sets up Wonder Room, which swaps the defense and special defense stats of all Pokemon on the field for five turns. This seems to give him enough special defense to tank two surfs from Jelly Beans, but after Stone Journer sets up a Stealth Rock, we high roll on the second surf, and down he goes. So last is Gordy's Colossal. As is standard, Gordy Dynamax is on turn one, so the Colossal Colossal nails Jelly Bean with a G-Max Vocalith. He then fairly handily tanks a four times super effective Surf, which activates Steam Engine, but that's fine. The rocks from G-Max Vocalith are a bit annoying, but with a held Citrus Berry, Jelly Beans can stall out another turn of Dynamax with Protect. Then I switch to Kit Kat, expecting a third G-Max Vocalith, but Gordy actually opts for Max Flare, which would have killed Kit Kat if it crit. Fortunately, it didn't, so Kit Kat lives. Well, I mean, technically she's already dead, but you get what I mean. I switch to Fundip, who thanks to evolving into 500 heaping pounds of sentient sand, easily shrugs off a heat crash. He still takes almost 50% after Stealth Rock and Vocalith chip, but a held Citrus Berry here ensured that he was never in any real danger, letting him fire off an Earth Power on the next turn, and winning us the 6 Gym Badge. With that, I can head to Sir Chester Bay, beat up a few Team Yell hooligans, and get the Aquatic Rotom Bike. This means that I can finally head to Axew's Eye in the wild area and get a few Colber Berries from the lone berry tree that sits on the tiny island. These would have been so helpful through my playthrough, but it's better late than never. I can also catch a Delmise from Route 9 now, but because Delmise is a 1% encounter and I already have a Ghost Grass type, I decide that it's not really worth it. So, the next stop is Spike Muth, where another battle with Marnie awaits. But given that this fight goes off without a hitch, and that we'll be fighting her again soon, let's skip to the next major fight, which is against her older brother, who also specializes in Dark types. At the very least, the 7th Gym Leader Pierce doesn't Dynamax. Instead, he has an Obstagoon that has maxed out HP and defense EVs, but we'll cross that bridge in a second. First off is his Scrafty, which hits Dots with a Sand Attack. I could have evolved Dots with a Reaper Cloth, but I decided that she's better off as a Dusclops with Eviolite. After successfully burning Scrafty with a Will-O-Wisp, even after the accuracy drop, I switch to Fundip, who easily shrugs off a now very weak Payback. Then, after Scrafty hits another Payback, we set up Stealth Rock. And with that, Fundip's job is done. So it's off to Whoppers, who gets hit by a Payback that still does hefty damage despite the burn. Curse Body activates yet again, which is just incredible given that it theoretically only has a 30% chance of activating. But ultimately, it doesn't even matter here because Scrafty goes down to a single Dazzling Gleam. Malamar comes in second, which is what the Stealth Rocks were for. With that tiny bit of chip damage, another Dazzling Gleam now guarantees the kill. That thing with Foul Play would have been insanely problematic for my team if I couldn't take him out in one shot. Obstagoon comes in third, and it's refreshing to see a gym leader not save their ace for last. I go for a Reflect type, which lets Whoppers survive a now resisted Throat Chop. Then I switch to Kit Kat on a now useless counter. Though obviously if I was 100% sure that he would go for counter, I could have just stayed in. But this is fine. Obstagoon goes for Obstruct, which doesn't block our Will-O-Wisp. And don't worry, Pierce's Obstagoon does not have guts. I checked. A Throat Chop on the next turn still does decent damage, but Body Press in return does way more. The not-so-subtle Kiss reference does live long enough to hit one more Throat Chop, but then falls to a second Body Press. So that just leaves Skuntank, which is still pretty annoying because he knows both Sucker Punch and Snarl. Fortunately, he opts for Sucker Punch on the first turn, which lets Kit Kat hit her with a second Will-O-Wisp that miraculously also connects. So Pepe Le Pew goes for a Screech on the next turn, before tanking a Bulldoze and surviving in the red after burn damage. Then with a switch to Warheads who's immune to Toxic, Skuntank falls to the burn damage, and we've won the 7th Gym Badge. There is quite literally nothing but a few cutscenes between the 7th and 8th gym badges. So after disposing of his gym trainers, it's time to face off against Raihan and his sort of dragon type team. It's actually more of a sandstorm team, and this double battle can be pretty tricky. In the only other Nuzlocke of this game I've done, I lost more than one Pokemon here. Raihan leads with Flygon and Gigalith, and I lead with Jelly Beans and Snowcaps. Gigalith automatically sets up the sand, which gives him a special defense boost. I start by instantly taking out my fave with an Ice Beam from Snowcaps. Then, with the help of a Wide Lens, I nail Gigalith with a Will-O-Wisp. 
That was a little risky since a miss could expose Snowcaps to a potentially deadly rock blast, but the AI is weird about multi-hit moves, and Gigalith just goes for Stealth Rock anyways. Sandaconda comes out next, so I protect with Snowcaps and then set up the rain with Jelly Beans. The idea here is to kill both of Raihan's Pokémon at the same time, so that it's a two-on-one against his Gigantamax Duraludon. This would have worked out perfectly if it weren't for the fact that when Snowcaps kills Sandaconda with an Ice Beam on the next turn, his Sand Spit ability activates and starts up another Sandstorm. I thought that Sand Spit only activated when the attack made physical contact, but this means that Jelly Bean Scald doesn't kill Gigalith. It ends up not really mattering, because Gigalith misses a Rock Blast, which thanks to Burn, probably wouldn't have killed Snowcaps anyways. But in hindsight, on the turn I protected with Snowcaps, I should have just nailed Gigalith with a Scald, which would have set up the double kill on the following turn. But whatever. As Duraludon comes in and Gigantamaxes into a Skyscraper, I switch Snowcaps to Warheads, who handily tanks a Max Steel Spike. And then I finish off Gigalith with a second Scald from Jellybean. On the next turn, Duraludon hits Jellicent with a Max Rockfall, which does pretty decent damage before we fire back with a Sacred Sword from Warheads, and a Will-O-Wisp that yet again connects. Raihan's Duraludon is physical, so this is pretty much over now. A switch to Fun Dip and a King Shield ensure that Duraludon's final turn of Dynamax is all but meaningless. And now that he's down to regular size, we can safely tank an Iron Head with Fun Dip, bring Duraludon into red with another Sacred Sword, and then flinch. Well, that's ever so slightly obnoxious, but it's obviously not a problem. Warheads finishes off Duraludon's last tick of HP with a Priority Shadow Sneak, winning us the 8th and final Gym Badge. This means it's off to Winden, where the end game of Pokémon Sword awaits. Level caps get a little weird here, since the standard Elite Four and Champion structure of almost every other game in the franchise gets uprooted. Instead, there's the Champion Cup, which has three different sections that constitute a varying number of battles. These three sections are also broken up by various story shenanigans, resulting in nine mini-boss battles, and one more battle against the legendary Pokémon Eternatus. Needless to say, I don't think it'd be a terribly good use of our time to hit every single one of these battles. But let's start with the first battle of the semifinals against Marnie. I don't really understand why there's more than one round of the semifinals, but wh whatever. The current level cap will end at the start of the first round of the finals, since that's the closest thing this game has to an Elite Four. So for now, I gotta make sure not to overlevel. Marnie leads with Liopard, and I lead with Whoppers, who is fast enough and strong enough to take out all of Marnie's non-Dynamaxed Pokémon with Dazzling Gleam. Unfortunately, Liopard is able to get off a Priority Prankster Torment before going down, meaning that I can't just spam the same move multiple times in a row. So, when Scrafty comes in, I have to use Reflect-type to survive the crunch. It drops my defense, and yet again activates Curse Body. I swear Whoppers is like an RNG magnet or something. But it again doesn't matter, as a Dazzling Gleam takes out Scrafty on the following turn. Next up is Toxicroak. I go for a Taunt, as Toxicroak hits a no longer resisted Venoshock, which somehow also activates Cursed Body. This means Toxicroak has to use Sucker Punch. So I switch to Warheads. Then it's just back to Whoppers. Now that Whoppers has her original typing back, I just spam Taunt until Toxicroak runs out of all five of her Sucker Punch PP. After that, a Psychic cleanly one-shots the Frog, bringing in the pesky Morpeko that wiped my previous attempt. But a Dazzling Gleam cleanly one-shots her before she can do a damn thing this time around. So that just leaves Grimmsnarl. He Gigantamaxes, par for the course, as Whoppers goes for a Reflect-type, making him Dark Fairy-type, and effectively stalling out Grimmsnarl's first turn of Dynamax as we now quad-resist a G-Max Snooze. Next up is a switch to Warheads on a now-baited Max Starfall, which seems to actually have pretty lousy synergy with G-Max Snooze's secondary effect. Doesn't really matter at this point though, I just use King's Shield on Grimmsnarl's third and final turn of Dynamax, and then once he becomes Baby Grim again, he hits us with a Priority Torment, before we retaliate with an Iron Head that gets a clean one-shot. With that, we've won the battle against the final Dark-type Specialist of the run. Next is the final battle against Hop, but we've ignored him up to this point, so we might as well continue that trend and just move on. The fight against Oleana and her Gigantamax Garbodor that comes next is also skippable. So we're gonna go to the final rounds of the Champion Cup. There's four battles here, kind of like the Elite Four, but you're able to switch Pokémon between rounds, so it doesn't feel exactly the same. The finals start with a surprise battle against the Wet Fart that's technically my third rival, Beedee. Or Bidet? I don't know. 
I've skipped over all the other fights with this guy because his psychic types get eviscerated by my ghosts, and this time is no different. His Gigantamax Hatterene, like with all Dynamax Pokemon, needs to be handled with caution, but other than that, this is a cakewalk and doesn't warrant any more screen time. Moving on. Round 2 is against Nessa, who has gotten a bit of a glow up team-wise since our fight against her for the second gym badge. She leads with Galissa Pod, and I lead with Whoppers. I'm not sure if she'll go for first impression, so I go for a protect on turn 1. It wouldn't have done much damage even if she did go for it, but ultimately she does not. Either way, Whoppers is at full HP as we cleanly one-shot Galissa Pod with a Thunderbolt. Second is Nessa's super fast Barrascuta. In fact, this Barrascuta is so fast that she even outspeeds Whoppers. So I switch to Jujubees for their debut battle, at least in this summary video. They handily tank a Throat Chop with the help of a held Culberberry. This also activates Jujubee's weak armor, giving them a speed boost that lets them outspeed and kill Barrascuta with a Giga Drain on the next turn. That felt pretty good. Third is Sea King, so it's off to Jelly Beans, who's immune to Waterfall. Sea King then sets up an Aqua Ring, as Jelly Beans misses his first Will-O-Wisp of the video. But this is a perfectly fine time to miss a Will-O-Wisp. I'm glad he's getting it out here. On the next turn, we connect, which is honestly overly cautious, because Megahorn isn't going to do anything at all to Whoppers anyways. But might as well be safe, I guess. Once Whoppers is safely in, the Sea King goes down to a Thunderbolt. Fourth is Pelipper, so after he sets up Rain, I'm sure you can guess what happens to him. Bye bye, Birdie. That just leaves Nessa's fearsome Dreadnought, who's actually an entirely different Dreadnought than the one she used in our gym battle. That one was male with Swift Swim, and this one is female, can Gigantamax, and thankfully has Shell Armor instead of Swift Swim. Because despite Gigantamaxing, an Expert Belt boosted times 4 super effective energy ball blows up the Mighty Turtle in one fell swoop. Nice try, Nessa. Better luck next time. Round 3 is against B and her fighting types, almost all of which are completely powerless to my ghost types. A handful of them still have potentially dangerous moves, but most of them just don't. Whoppers is able to one-shot her first four Pokemon, and Machamp literally cannot damage Fireball thanks to Flash Fire, but let's give some of these Benchwarmers a little bit of spotlight. Remember when Airheads was an integral member of the team? And look, I'm finally bringing nerds to a battle! Plus, by using the bench warmers, it'll prevent my other mons from gaining too many levels before Raihan. B's lead Halucha gets outsped and goes down to a Choice Specs boosted Psychic from Snowcaps, as does her second Pokemon Surfetched, which does no Brutal Swing. I think that Psychic was a damage roll there, but a critical hit Brutal Swing wouldn't have killed Snowcaps anyways. Third is Phalanx, which is just an adorable Pokemon, but a single Psychic still pops their collective minds like a bunch of grapes. Graplocked is fourth, and is actually bulky enough to survive a Psychic with a Sliver, but guess who doesn't have a way to hit Ghost types? B does use a full restore here, but with two more Psychics, it's lights out for the Cephalopod. So last is the Machamp, whose only way to damage our entire team is with Max Flare. This seems like a pretty good job for Jelly Beans, who comes in on Machamp's first turn of Dynamax, and eats up the first of three Max Flares. Machamp has Guts here, so the only thing I can really do is just recover and Citrus Berry stall out the second Max Flare, and then tank the third and final Max Flare on the following turn, before setting up Rain with Rain Dance. With that, Machamp is effectively completely neutralized. Sure, I could accidentally burn her with Scald, but I don't because I'm amazing at this game, and even if I did, it wouldn't really matter. A few turns later, and we've beaten B, advancing us to the finals of the finals, I guess. That pits us up against Raihan for the second time. Here though, it's a single battle, and his team has changed quite a bit. He starts with a Torkoal that instantly sets up the sun with drought, so I immediately change it to rain with jelly beans, forcing Torkoal to unintentionally charge up a solar beam. He's not getting that off though, because a Scald drowns the tortoise on the following turn. Next is Gudra, who requires a little bit of caution because she knows Thunder, as well as Surf and Muddy Water. Fortunately, switches between Jelly Beans and Kit Kat completely trivialize that moveset. Theoretically, I could just switch back and forth between them until Gudra runs out of Thunder PP, and then just kill her with Jelly Beans for free. But I decide to take the short and slightly more dangerous route by going into Dots and taking her out with two Ice Punches. Even in the rain, Surf doesn't do much to my Eviolite boosted Cyclops, so this is all pretty safe, and Gudra falls after a few more turns. Third is Flygon, so it's off to my resident mascot killer. 
A Colber Berry ensures that Snowcaps will survive a super effective crunch, but Flygon just goes for Sandstorm. That's not going to save you here, buddy. He goes down to an Ice Beam on the following turn. Fourth is Turtonator, so I switch to Fireball, who's sporting an Assault Vest in case Raihan decides to do something that might actually do damage. But he doesn't. Two Shadow Balls are enough to take out the Koopa King as he just sets up a sunny day, which is better for me than it is for him. That just leaves Raihan with Skyscraper Duraludon. So I switch to Warheads on a Max Rockfall, which does pitiful damage, as does the second one on the following turn, especially after some leftovers recovery. We retaliate with a Sacred Sword that manages to crit for about 50% of his HP. Then I use King Shield to change forms as Duraludon hits what is easily the weakest max move I've ever seen. It did 6 whole damage. That's adorable. Or pathetic. Take your pick. After that though, Warheads easily finishes off Tiny Dawn with a second Sacred Sword, winning us the final fight of the Champion Cup Finals. All that's left is to face off against the Champion Leon. No, just kidding, it's time for the conclusion of the mediocre story where I have to fight the secret evil boss and save the world. Chairman Rose's team gets swept by flamethrowers from Fireball, other than his Gigantamax Copperaja, who's dispatched by the rest of our team. We can skip it. The semi-raid battle against Eternatus can be kinda scary, but it's actually the perfect job for nerds with an assault vest. For one, they can use Dig to stall out turns as Zashian and Zamazenta do the heavy lifting. And for two, if they die to a crit or something, I think I'd be able to find the strength to move on. Thankfully, they do end up surviving because funerals are pretty expensive. So with that, the world is saved, and I can get back to my battle against Leon for the champion title. Normally, I don't use an individual level cap for the champion fight because it immediately follows the Elite Four, but since there is a break here and Leon's ace is 10 full levels higher than Raihan's, this is a special case. So, here's the final team that I'll be using, leveled up to level 62 to match the weakest of Leon's Pokemon instead of his ace. Our team is looking solid, some of my very first team members and some of my last. Let's see if they've got what it takes to become champions and finish this Nuzlocke Spooktacular. Leon leads with his own Aegislash, and I lead with Candycorn. I'm so happy that the Halloweeniest of my Pokemon made the final team. By using Phantom Force, I'm able to coax Aegislash out of his shield form on the first turn. And then on the next turn, we land a clean one-shot. Second for Leon is Dragapult, yet another ghost type. While it was certainly possible for me to get one of these guys, Dreepy doesn't evolve until level 50 and Dracloak doesn't evolve until level 60, so it wouldn't have been all that useful until very late in the game anyways, and I wanted to close out the game with the team members that have been with me throughout my journey. After all, Halloween is the holiday of friendship. Maybe, I don't know. As I go for a Phantom Force, Dragapult fires off a nasty Shadow Ball, which leaves Candy Corn with just 2 HP. A held Focus Sash would have ensured a survival in the case of a crit. This lets Candy Corn nail the Speedy Dragon with a critical hit Phantom Force, bringing his kill count up to 2. But third is Inteleon, and it's time for my spooky friend to make a noble sacrifice. He hits Inteleon with a priority Shadow Sneak, and then a Dark Pulse drains the last bit of life force from my undead angel. Whoppers comes in to replace her fallen friend, and easily outspeeds and dispatches Leon's murderous gecko. So fourth is Haxorus. A super effective Dazzling Gleam isn't quite enough for the kill, so she's able to retaliate with an Earthquake, though a second Focus Sash lets Whoppers hang on with 1 HP. And of course also activates Cursed Body. Because why not? Here's where Leon burns through his lone full restore, so it's a few more turns before his second and final dragon type falls. Fifth is Mr. Rhyme, which is easily the goofiest of Leon's Pokemon. But you should never underestimate a goofball, because behind that mustache and under that ridiculous top hat is a mind with enough mental fortitude to be able to survive a super effective stab-boosted Shadow Ball from Whoppers meaning that Whoppers has finally met her match as she falls to a Psychic. That's two team members down, but their sacrifices won't be in vain. Dots, with vengeance in her eyes, or eye, comes in and snuffs out Mr. Rhyme with a priority Shadow Sneak. That leaves Leon with just one last Pokemon, but that Pokemon is his fearsome Charizard. And since Game Freak has never made a Ghost Rock type, this thing's pretty terrifying. Fortunately, I can bring in Fireball to absorb what is surely going to be a nasty G-Max Wildfire. 
But after Charizard Gigantamaxes, my heart plummets as Leon makes an incredible read and nails my chandelier with a super effective max rockfall. It is only by the grace of Arceus that he manages to survive in the red. A tad more and we would be digging yet another grave. On the following turn I switch to Warheads on a second and much weaker max rockfall. I don't want Leon to get wildfire residual damage, so I make a risky switch back to Fireball, which fortunately pays off and spares his ghostly life. From here, Charizard's Gigantamax is over, so it's off to Kit Kat who shrugs off an Ancient Power, which fortunately does not get the Omni Boost. But I mean imagine how unlucky you'd have to be to find yourself on the opposite end of an Omni Boost in the fight against the champion. So Charizard does get off a powerful Fire Blast on the next turn, but it's not nearly enough. With one rock slide, the mighty lizard goes down, winning us the battle and the run. With that, another monolock challenge is complete, leaving one final type to conquer. Using ghost types was a blast. They tend to be pretty good in general, but it's funny to see how much they can struggle in certain matchups. I really enjoyed playing through the Galar region again. Are these perfect games? No. But they have a lot to enjoy, including a really rich regional dex and access to a lot of different tools that let you be more creative with how you tackle specific threats. And especially when playing without Dynamax, they happen to have some pretty unique challenges that you can't find in any other game. Let me know in the comments what challenges you'd want to see me try in these games in the future. And as always, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And be sure to join the Flag on HG community Discord where you can discuss Nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.